beer, didn't know people still use that. And so um, it, it was a frontier movement, uh, started during a, a cultural movement in our history called the Second Great Awakening. And the Second uh, Great Awakening was a period in our country marked by Americans returning to religion and coming back to religion. And so all, uh, all different denominations were, were getting bigger during this time, and it was a period of growth, a kind of opposite period we're in now in our, our, our country. You need a third great awakening. Uh, that's another Sunday school class. Um, and so uh, it's a movement, and uh, the way uh, Google Shelley put this in uh, the book, I, wanted, I just want to be a Christian, he said it's a movement reaching for the unification of all Christians in a single body, patterned after the, uh, the church of the New Testament. And I grew up with that thinking that, that what we're looking for is to be like the New Testament church. And it was actually started by the merger of two groups. Now, the first group was a guy uh, by the name of Barton W. Stone. And I think I have a picture of him, Melissa. Yep, there he is. Uh, and Barton Stone um, it was from Cambridge, Kentucky. Uh, his movement, his, the religious movement, he kind of got started uh, happened in the Great Cambridge Revival in 1801. And what their aim was, was to disassociate with denominationalism. Uh, they, wanted, um, they wanted to call people out of denominationalism into uh, uh, one group. And he withdrew from the Springfield um, uh, Presbyterian and uh, referred to the churches that they planted as Christians, just Christians. Uh, and so that movement was happening at a similar time, a, a movement by a couple guys named Thomas and Alexander Campbell. Now, uh, they were from Scotland, uh, both educated in Scotland, uh, and their movement started in western Pennsylvania in a part of Virginia that is now West Virginia. And you go up there and you still see uh, tons of Church of Christ and Christian churches, and they're so closely tied together that a lot of Christian churches never changed their name. And you walk into a, a, a Church of Christ, and it might be instrumental, and it might not be, in Eastern Kentucky and in West Virginia. Um, and so that's how deeply embedded the Church of Christ was there. Uh, they were educated in Scotland. They moved here uh, at the beginning of the decade, of, or the, the last part of the first decade of the 19th century, probably about seven or eight years after Cambridge. Um, both Thomas and Alexander believed that creeds divided the church instead of unifying it. And they had four core beliefs. And if you listen to these beliefs, they're still beliefs that we hold to today. They believed in congregational autonomy, uh, which means that uh, in the Stone Campbell movement, churches are typically truly non-denominational churches. That we do not have a denominational headquarters somewhere telling us what to do or how to do it. Um, they believe in the plurality of elders, which we still follow here today. They believed in weekly communion, and some churches had gone to do it, uh, doing it bi-weekly or even monthly, and they wanted, they wanted communion to be every week, and they believed in baptism by immersion. And those are all four things that we still follow today. Um, and these two movements joined together after a series of meetings, and they fi finally became one movement when Barton W. Stone and Raccoon John Smith, that was his name, remember, Frontier, uh, Raccoon John Smith and Barton W. Stone shook hands, and it became one movement. And Raccoon John Smith was there representing Alexander Campbell at the meeting. And by the end of the 19th century, um, several years later, uh, these fractured into three main groups, although there are definitely offshoots of these today. Uh, the Church of Christ, the Christian Church, and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. So... A church like um, Central Christian Church, which is close to here, they're actually one of our sister churches, and they, they talk about the Restoration Movement the way we talk about the Restoration Movement, and, uh, and very, uh, a lot in common with the way uh, the theology and the way we believe and the way we function. Um, and we'll talk more about their division later, but by 1906, uh, the Census Bureau did a religious uh, census of religious groups and that was the first time that the three groups were formally recognized as uh, being distinct groups. But the fracture had actually begun right around the uh, time of the Civil War, uh, a couple decades earlier. Now, 
a couple thoughts before we get deep in the middle of this. Luckily for us, these guys wrote a lot of articles, and they wrote a lot of letters, and they all had journals, and they wrote in these journals, and so we have a record of what these guys thought about and the way they thought about things, and even some of the evolution in their thinking. And it's important to realize that although every quote is accurate, it may not represent everything they always thought about everything. Like anybody, if you hear a quote from someone, that's how they thought at that one moment. But it, that sometimes that transitions over the years, and we'll even see some of that in the way these guys talk. I, I know if you asked me a question in 1991 and asked me the same question today, it might be completely different from the question you got decades earlier on almost every topic. So I want to give these guys a little room to evolve and breathe, and we're just capturing a moment. And, and, and like scripture, these quotes could be taken out of context. And so I tried very carefully to do the research and to make sure that we're getting cl as close to what they thought at that time as possible. But just remember, they're a picture, a snapshot of a time and place. Um, now, when it comes to women's roles in the church, which is what we're tracking through the restoration movement, there have always been three ideas about women's role with church within the restoration movement. The first one is that women could not participate vocally in the assembly or not hold any leadership position whatsoever. The second one is that women can participate in, vocally in a limited capacity and hold limited leadership options. And you hear this vocalized several ways. Uh, you'll hear people say they think women can do anything but be elders and be the minister. Or you'll, you'll tell, you'll, people will use scripture for it and say they think women can pray and prophesy in church because that's what scripture said. That's, that's typically the second option. And then the third option is that women are unlimited in their vocal participation and leadership roles. And women can do anything that men can do in the church. And there's a lot of gray areas in between those where people believe part of one and part of the other. But typically, all throughout our history, these three beliefs ha have been present. Um, the historian Bill Grasham, who uh, did a lot of this research, I depended on him a lot, he, um, presented this in 1999 in Abilene Christian University. This is what he says about it. There has never been a completely uniform view of the role of women in the work of worship in the church in the restoration movement. And this was particularly true in America at the turn of the 19th century. So this historian believes that looking at it, that there's never been a completely uniform view on this issue and that all three elements of the belief system have existed. Now, uh, right at the turn of century, there were two female preachers. Uh, this is the turn of the 19th century, so we're talking 1800. One was Nancy Cram, and the other one was Abigail Roberts. Now, as far as I can tell, there's no pictures of Nancy Cram that exist. That is Abigail Roberts. Uh, they planted churches all along the eastern seaboard. They baptized hundreds of people. Abigail Roberts was actually a disciple of Nancy Cram. Uh, their churches took the name either Church of Christ or Christian Church, and the number of churches um, in the Stone-Campbell movement, especially the Stone side of the movement, right at first, had women that did all kinds of activities. Uh, they had uh, teachers, exhorters, and preachers. Now, that exhorters is an interesting thing because we don't have that position in church today. But all through uh, the 19th century, they did have that position, and it was, um, I don't know exactly how to describe it, except it was the person who gets up after the sermon. Um, and what we do is we do a sermon, and then we'll do an invitation, and then we'll have an invitation song. Well, the exhorter's role was to get up after the sermon and give the invitation. And a lot of times that would be added with a testimony, and so the preacher wouldn't give the invitation himself or would give a, a smaller invitation, and then in in. With the, they still had like altar calls or invitation songs and interspersed in there someone would get up and ask people to respond to the gospel. And, uh, and, and a lot of times that were people all over the church from different backgrounds and different, um, different ways of life. And this was a, this was a common practice among churches uh, in the early 1800s. Um, the, and they had exhorters at Cane Ridge at the Cane Ridge Revival which was the revival that started all of this. 
Uh, this is from um, the revival at Cambridge by Mark Harper, and this is the way he describes it. Although only ministers preached and prepared sermons, literally hundreds of people, this is, this is at Cane Ridge. This is not just a normal Sunday. This is at the big revival. Um, literally hundreds of people became spontaneous exhorters, excitingly giving spiritual advice or tearful warnings. Almost everyone, women, small children, slaves, the shy, the illiterate, could exhort with great effect. One seven-year-old girl mounted a man's shoulders and spoke uh, wondrous words until she was completely fatigued. When she laid her head on, on his as if to sleep, someone in the audience suggested the poor thing had better be laid down to rest. And the girl roused and said, don't call me poor, for Christ is my brother, God is my father, I have the kingdom to inherit, and therefore do not call me poor, for I am rich in the blood of the Lamb. Seven-year-old girl at Cane Ridge. And so, and I, I pulled just a, a, one quote out of that big, long story. Almost anyone, women, small children, slaves, the shy, the illiterate, could exhort with great effect uh, in these times of the early church. So from the very beginning, uh, 200 and something years ago, uh, there were women taking a vocal role in these uh, worship assemblies. Um, and Barton W. Stone at the time that uh, believed that women could participate, and this is what he said, women could pray and prophesy along with men in the worship assemblies as long as they covered their heads as a sign of subjection to their husbands. Now, this was his view uh, up until probably the early 1830s, and his view morphed over time to become more restrictive of women's roles. And in 1836, he wrote, uh, by divine authority, the women who composed part of the worship are forbidden to usurp authority over a man or teach, but to be in silence. And a lot of people think that his view of that shifted so he could be in communion with the Campbell side of the movement that he moved kind of his theology to theirs uh, so that they could be seen as one group. Uh, uh, Campbell definitely took uh, a pretty restrictive role, uh, I view of what women could do. Uh, he says this um, in 1840. Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to learn in silence. I submit to Paul and teach the same lesson. And so even though he did not believe women could participate vocally in church, he did believe that you could have women deacons as a leadership position in church. He said this in uh, 1827, uh, amongst the Greeks who had paid so much regard to differences of sex, female deacons or deaconesses, um, I'm sorry, who paid so much regard to differences of sex, female deacon, deacons or deaconesses were appointed to visit and wait upon the sisters. And another thing about Campbell is even though he didn't believe women's role should be outside of the domestic sphere, he still believed that women should be educated. And that was not always the majority opinion at this point in history by, from a lot of different groups. And so he was a big believer because of the role in child rearing that women should be educated right along with the men in colleges and universities. And so it seems like uh, Alexander Campbell uh, was against women participating, but he also was open to other opinions, especially in the pages of his journal. Um, William Pinkerton wrote in the Millennial Harbinger, which was Alexander Campbell's journal, he said, it, is hardly, it will hardly be questioned by any well-informed brother that if our sister in Christ may unite her voice with her brother in songs of praise and adoration and thanksgiving to God, she may not be denied the privilege of lifting her voice in prayer and supplication to her father. And so he wrote that in uh, Campbell's own journal. And uh, many believe that most churches of Christ, especially the middle part of the 19th century, um, and Christian churches followed Campbell's admonition on the silence of women. But there's some evidence that that may not have been as normative across the board as, as once thought. Uh, W.K. Pendleton, who was the co-editor of the Millennial Harbinger, which was Alexander Campbell's paper, uh, received letters from a esteemed brother, Farrat, 
we don't have a record of his first name, uh, concerning the question, shall a woman pray or exhort in public? And Pendleton admitted that women can pray and exhort in private meetings without any violation of scripture and with the very happiest of results, even though some brother should be present. Um, and then he goes on to later to say, and I, I thought this was fascinating, I don't know if it's true or not, but he said that, um, that there were, um, outside of Campbell's home congregation, uh, that he did not, he only knew of two or three congregations that did not allow women to do all the acts of worship. And so it may not be as normative right at that point as they thought, but at least as that century went on, there was definitely a restriction of women's roles from what had been earlier uh, in the beginning of the uh, Stone uh, part of the movement and at Cane Ridge. Uh, and in the um, Encyclopedia of the Stone Campbell movement, they attribute it to this. Uh, the decline of women serving in public roles was due to the church's strong relationship to the ideals of the emerging fundamentalist movement as both an intellectual and popular movement because of gender and family issues. Fundamentalist uh, periodicals glorified the domestic, domestic sphere using select scriptures uh, repeatedly, all scriptures we've studied in this study, uh, to mandate that women remain silent in the church. So as the 19th century went on, uh, that did become more restrictive. Um, and by the end of the Civil War, you started to see great divisions uh, in the American Restoration Movement uh, that would lead to the three different distinct groups. And those, were li those differences were due to a number of things. And historically, if you liked American history or you paid attention to American history, you've heard of some of these movements and some of these things. The first real disagreement was the disagreements over slavery uh, between the two groups. And this was not always geographical, but most of the time it was geographical. And I say not always because uh, my people come from a little town in Tennessee called Holiday, Tennessee. My grandmother's maiden name was Holiday. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But her family were actually Union sympathizers and against slavery. And when there was, in the, it was stereotypical at this time, a family divided because some of the family fought with the Confederacy, but some were Union sympathizers. And one of the Union sympathizers got in so good that they made him a state senator, and he actually saved the life of some of the Confederates. And so even though this was the state of Tennessee, it didn't always line up on geographical lines, but most of the time it did. And a lot of the Christian churches up north or the Church of Christ up north uh, were against slavery. A lot of Christian churches and churches of Christ in the south uh, were, were advocating for the slavery's continuing, and that started to drive a division in the two groups. Um, the second group was, the second one is economic differences. Uh, the churches in the uh, uh, Stone Campbell movement up north had tons of money. Uh, the ones in south, uh, especially where Sherman had taken a swatch through the, the south, uh, hardly had any money. And so there were, there were disagreements on how that money should be used. Uh, there were disagreements over instrumental music, which is the one that is, is classically given as the reason for the division. The fascinating thing is, the instrumental music uh, issue was also an economic issue. And I have a friend who wrote a dissertation on this. And the churches in the South were watching these churches in the North buy organs. And they're like, what in the world? We're eating our shoes down here. We don't have any money. And you're up there buying organs? Send us some of the money. And so you started to find these real disagreements over instrumental music, partly scriptural, but partly also very cultural uh, tied up in some of the economic issues that were going on in the time. Um, and uh, missionary societies was a big reason. Uh, the, uh, some of the churches that end up being a part of the Christian church had started these missionary societies, and they were parachurch organizations. Uh, some of the people in the Churches of Christ uh, that, you know, stayed with that name were, were nervous about the missionary societies, and especially some of the ones that were run by women. And that started to become a real kind of disagreement that was happening there. And then the last one is women issues. Uh, and matter of fact, Lipscomb said 
he was willing to stay in fellowship with the Christian church all the way up until the women issue came. And that's where he finally drew the line and said, no, we're two distinct groups. Um, the women issues was, were definitely connected to the missionary societies and some of the leadership within them, but they were also connected to the temperance movement. And the temperance movement was a movement of mostly women and former slaves who thought that alcohol should be illegal. And it was mostly women because uh, it was their husbands that were going to the bars at night and drinking up all the money. And so the women started this movement and some of the greatest speakers of any, anybody out there in America were these women who were speaking of the temperance movement. Matter of fact, I believe, I'd have to go back and look this up, but um, Frederick Douglass's what is the, um, what to the slave is the 4th of July speech was actually at a temperance movement event. So there was a lot of crossover between temperance, abolition, and, and women's suffrage. Um, and the reason that's important is because there was this woman in the Churches of Christ slash Christian Church named Clara Babcock. And she was a speaker in the temperance movement. And what happened is she would come to these churches and she would speak on behalf of the temperance movement. And she would do such a good job speaking. She was such a good speaker that they would ask her to stay over and preach on Sunday morning, kind of like we did with Justin. Uh, and he was here yesterday, and we asked him to stay over and speak uh, on Sunday morning. And so that's that. And she was such a good speaker that people were saying, well, why isn't this lady our preacher? And so in uh, 1889, a restoration church um, in the Erie Christian Church ordained Clara Babcock uh, to be an ordained preacher. Uh, and this was seen as a real dividing line between churches going one way or the other. Um, and then the last of the women's issues was over women's suffrage, which is the fight for women to have the vote. And a lot of these quotes come from Church of Christ leaders, some of which you've heard of in talking about uh, whether women should be able to vote and how that affects women issues within the church and within society. Now, I want to give a little bit of a disclaimer here. I don't like some of these quotes. I don't like reading them. Uh, please don't say amen to any of them. Uh, they, are, they are hard to hear. They're hard to read. And I want to make sure that I'm not, you don't think that I think these things as I'm reading them. Um, but these are um, people, of, like I said, several of which you've heard of. Uh, the first one is James A. Harding. This is writing in 1903. Uh, Harding, who Harding University was named for, he, said, he says this, Paul lays down the general law under which he makes the special legislation concerning women speaking in church. It is wrong for her to usurp authority anywhere. The same principles that prevent her from teaching in the church prevail in the schoolroom or anywhere else. It is a question of women usurping authority over a man and becoming leaders of them. Uh, David Lipscomb wrote it this way. Uh, for a woman to, to enter the work of public speaking or of a leadership in the affairs of this world is to cut them off from childbearing. He continues. Woman's work in life is to hear, is to bear and chain children. No higher, holier, or more sacred work has ever been committed to human beings. I agree with part of that. Um, this is her chiefest work in life. Chiefest is not a word. Um, if there were not a passage of scripture on the subject except to indicate this, it would forbid her in engaging in work incompatible with, with this. Public speaking and any of the callings of life that demand a constant strain on the mind, a constant anxiety and care in reference to the public affairs of church or state, an excitement of the ambitions for place and power not only destroy her taste for and cause her to neglect the home and family duties, the duties of a wife and mother, but such a strain on the mind destroys the ability for childbearing, uh, which is, again, difficult to hear. Now, probably one of, the, one of the clearest advocates for this was a guy by the name of R.C. Bell, who wrote um, many articles on this kind of stuff. Um, and he says this, women are not permitted to exercise dominion over a man in any calling of life. When a woman gets her diploma to practice medicine, every Bible student knows 
that she is violating God's holy law. When a woman secures a license to practice law, if she is, she's guilty of the same offense. When a woman mounts the lecture platform or steps into the pulpit or public schoolroom, she is disobeying God's law and disobeying the promptings of her inner nature. When God gives his reason for woman's subjection and quietness, he covers the whole ground and forbids her to work in any public capacity. She is not fitted to do anything publicly. Every public woman, lawyer, doctor, lecturer, preacher, teacher, clerk, sales girl, and all would step from their post of public work into their father or husband's home where most of them prefer to be and where God puts them. You are now no longer a public slave, but a companion, a homemaker for a man. You are now the only place where your womanly influence has full play and power. He also said this, if it is a shame um, for a woman to be a public speaker, why is it not also a shame for her to be a public writer? I'm going to continue to power through these. Uh, E.G. Sewell, another writer and Church of Christ thinker at the time, says it this way. If women get the right to vote, it will unleash a view of marriage which, if allowed to spread, threatens to destroy the most sacred of all institutions and make America a homeless nation. E.W. Hendren, who was a friend of David Lipscomb, says it this way. Voting women violate the scriptural principle of wives submitting to their husbands. He also said this. Uh, this is fascinating. If the saloon cannot be destroyed except by women's suffrage, we say, let the saloon stay. In other words, even though they were mostly for prohibition, if it came down between someone getting drunk or a woman having the right to vote, bring on the alcohol Amen. to these guys. Now, Lipscomb, in talking about the church, uh, there was a time when Lipscomb once believed that women could teach in mixed assemblies as long as it wasn't the main worship assembly. Um, but he backed, that off, backed off that later and said women could only teach in a private setting. Now, there's, a huge, there's this long exchange of letters between he and a, um, an elder's wife uh, from Fayetteville, Arkansas, I think. No, Fayetteville, Tennessee. And her name is Selena Holman. I wish I could read you the whole exchange between them. But to this, she sent him a fascinating letter. She said, suppose a dozen men and women were in my parlor and I talked to them of the gospel and exhorted them to obey it. Exactly how many would have to be added to the number to make my talk and the exhortation a public instead of a private one? Like she's looking for an exact number. When does it become public and no longer private? And I think it's a fascinating question. Um, and I, I, I want to say this. I read these quotes. I don't want to get too judgy on all of this because all these people were a product of their time. And we didn't grow up in their time. And we don't know how we would have thought if we would have grown up in their time. And I, I, I want to be careful about that. But I also want to say, I don't like those quotes. I don't like the words that they're using. Uh, because it feels misogynistic and it feels like uh, very restrictive in a way. And I think it's important for us to note that for three reasons. The first one is the men who most shaped our theology on this issue did not want women to have the right to vote. And the men who sh most shaped our theology on this issue did not want women to usurp authority inside or outside of the church. Um, and if you are a doctor, uh, they would have thought that you were in violation of scriptures, if, if you're a woman. Uh, if you are a woman and you are an attorney, they would have thought you are in violation of the scriptures. If you're a politician, they would have thought you're in violation of the scriptures. If you're a principal and you had any men teachers under you, they would have thought you were in violation of the scripture. And the, if you were a teacher, uh, of a high school class that had boys in your class, they would have thought you were in violation of scripture. Uh, if you were a nurse and any man was under your care, they would have thought you were in violation of the scripture. That we had, you know, that the men who most shaped our theology on this, they believe that what applies to here applies to out there as well. And as a church, we follow them inside the room, but we won't follow them out of the room. And they would have never have even considered this idea of women coming to church and being in subjection in church 
but going out there and being considered equal outside of the church. They would never even consider that as an option. And, I, you know, my feeling as I'm looking back on this, uh, that they were either right about both or neither. Uh, and I, I feel pretty strongly about that. But the other thing is this, the third thing is this, the men who most shaped our theology on this issue seemed fixated more on culture than scripture. And that's important because there's this feeling out there that, um, that we have, um, that somehow this is being motivated right now by the culture around us. And it's been said a, different, a bunch of different ways, like, are you guys becoming woke? Or um, are you, um, you know, is this about uh, women's lib or whatever? You know, it's, it's been said that the churches who've gone through the study have some sort of agenda uh, that's culturally based and not scripturally based. And what I would argue is that was exactly the problem uh, for, these, for these men who shaped our theology at this time. So they were responding to the culture more than they were scripture. And they weren't hiding it. They were absolutely writing about it. And so I think that's important for us to keep in mind that there's a sense in which we're saying, you know what, let's return to scripture. Uh, this, we're, not, we're not letting culture dictate this. Uh, we're saying, let's, let's go back and see what Scripture actually says. And that's what I admire so much about the way our shepherds have taken this study on, is they've just said, let's, let's go back and read the Scriptures and see what they said. Let's, let's see if we can make them agree with each other in ways that give us a clear guide of how to go forward. Um, now, the position of restrictive women, that they had to be totally silent inside and outside the church, within the churches of Christ, was the dominant position for about 25 years. 20, 20 to 25 years, you heard very little disagreement. Although there were some writers uh, like G.C. Brewer, uh, who was much more moderate in his tone in writing this issue. And then in 1938, C.R. Nickel published a book called God's Woman. And this book was a game changer. And uh, what we know, if you're paying close attention last week, is that book in 1938 inspired Gary, book, uh, Gary Burke to write a book called God's Woman Revisited, uh, which uh, the elders have purchased for people in this church uh, to read. Uh, and, and our elders were inspired uh, by that book and several others so much that they thought they wanted to present that information to our church and even bring Gary here. Now, I would go back through some of the arguments uh, that uh, Nickel makes in that 1938 book, but essentially that's what's been happening uh, for the last five weeks. And we bought everybody a copy of the book so you can go read it. Um, and, but I do think it's interesting to go back and see what some of the response to that book was in 1938 because uh, as any book ever, there are endorsements that come along with this. And this book was endorsed by several people. And so I want to read some of the endorsements from this original 1938 book. This is a guy uh, named M.O. Daly. And he said, I know of no book that so thoroughly covers the subject, false doctrine is exposed, and truth, uh, and, and truth is made to stand out. Now, the other quote uh, recommending this book is by a guy by the name of N.B. Hardiman. Yes, that N.B. Hardiman, who Freed Hardiman was named after, where Joel and I attended college, and he said this about Nichols' book. This is the most thorough discussion of what the Bible says about women. The arguments are clear and logical. I verily believe that he has gone to the heart of what Paul had in mind and brought forth truth. This book will serve as a textbook at Freed Hardiman College. Now, in 1980, None of Your Business, I went to Fried Hardeman, and this was not a textbook. Um, matter of fact, you could not get up at Fried Hardeman and say what N.B. Hardeman said about this book. And it's fascinating to me that we, we, we feel like that there's been this huge monolithic view of this issue through our history, and historically that's just not been the case. And N.B. Hardeman, uh, you know, endorsed this book and taught it to his students. This, let me put it a different way. The same book, similar book, and the arguments have been presented uh, 
in, in, in the past five months, arguments is a strong word, the, the, the information that's been presented the past five weeks is the same information that Fried Hartman students were getting in 1939. And it also says that this is not some new thing that we're just getting now. We, what we've really been talking about is a conversation that's been around since the 30s uh, that's been presented in a more modern form in Gary's book and been presented as we've gone through it as a congregation. So it is, um, it's fascinating how much our perspective gets myopically focused on just what we know. We don't always see the brighter world out there. And that's, that's my story. Uh, my, my, my focus on this issue uh, has, has, I've always had a question about it. But it was, I, I grew up at a church who wouldn't have even had this study. And um, I grew up, I'm, uh, fourth generation on one side in the Churches of Christ. Brendan would be the fifth generation raised. My great grandfather uh, was a reader. He loved to read books. He loved to read scripture. I actually have some of his books. I have a copy of his of a book about the Civil War that he had that was actually written in 1865, which was the year after the Civil War ended. Maybe the year the Civil War ended. Uh, fact check me on that, Jared. Um, the um, and. And so I have a bunch of his old books, um, and he read scripture, and there was a local church of Christ uh, planted by a guy by the name of Guyan Woods, uh, who was the editor of the Gospel Advocate for a while, and that's where he landed uh, to go to church because he thought they were being the most biblical. And it was important for him to read scripture and go to a place that was also focusing on scripture. And that carried down. My grandmother was exactly the same way. I've talked about her uh, in this before, uh, so I had I have several generations on one side of my family. On the other side of my family, um, I was the 50th person in my family to go to Fried Hartman. Um, I have a lot of cousins. Um, and so, um, and so I, I, I grew up immersed in this conversation and, and a lot of the conversations that we have as a church. Matter of fact, I, I mentioned G.C. Brewer earlier. His great-grandniece, is a lady by the name of Jeannie, uh, and she's uh, she and her husband and Dana and I go to Grizzlies games together when we're in Memphis, and we have a text chain about gri the Memphis Grizzlies that we talk all the time. Like these people are not, these people are very real to me because I grew up immersed in this stuff. Um, my um, in the sixth grade, I remember my poor sixth grade teacher. Uh, I remember asking my sixth grade teacher, "Why is it that my sisters can pray in front of me?" at the dinner table, but they can't pray in front of me at church. And he said, I'll never forget. And this is, this, not judging this guy, because he probably had a hundred of these questions from me. Uh, but he finally just said, you know, real Christians don't ask those kind of questions. Um, and you know what? I, I quit asking him. But I didn't quit having him. Um, and so this, it's always been a pursuit for me for truth. Um, my grandmother once told me, uh, this is a great story. She and I were talking about this in the late 90s. And my grandmother's a great Bible student. Uh, she and I disagreed on some of this stuff. And we were discussing through it. And she said, you know, sometimes, though, I think you're right. I said, wait, what? Uh, and she said, when I was a little girl at Holiday Church of Christ, on the Wednesday night prayer meetings, I remember women praying in front of the men uh, at the prayer meetings. I said, really? She said, yeah. And she said, in every closing prayer, all the men would get down on one knee. She said, if you did either one of those things at the church I go to now, I'd be considered a liberal. She said, I've been conservative so long, I'm a liberal. Um, and, but it does go to show how things change over time. And, and, I, and I think every church deserves this little bit of credit, is that we're all trying to be more scriptural. Uh, and we're all trying to study this stuff together. Um, my um, great influences on my life, um, uh, Rube, just a few more minutes, I promise. Uh, Rubel Shelley uh, had a big impact on me. I, I've only met him a couple times, but I was sitting with my wife in his church in Nashville um, in the late 90s, and he's the first person I ever heard say out loud that scripturally speaking, he thinks women can do anything but be an elder and be the, the preaching minister for a church.
And I'd never heard anyone say that out loud, much less in a, tr in a church. And to hear someone say that at that time period was revolutionary, revolutionary for me. Uh, Richard Oster has been a huge impact on my life. Uh, Richard Oster wrote the College Press Commentary on Corinthians. Uh, he actually had a kid in my youth group uh, when I was in Memphis. Uh, he's a New Testament scholar uh, and brilliant, brilliant man. I actually heard him uh, do a communion talk one time. And he was reading scripture, and he was actually reading from the Greek and translating in real time into English as he read the passage. Um, I um, was heavily influenced by John Mark Hicks, uh, who is a church historian. Matter of fact, I depended on some of his um, of material for this work. He has a blog with a lot of these old restoration quotes on it um, and has ha had conversations with him all throughout this process. He and I don't agree completely on this issue. Uh, he would be much less, he is, he is almost no restriction at all on what women can do in church, but still through conversations in iron sharpening iron kind of way, uh, that's, that's been a good conversation for me. But maybe one of the most important influences was, for me was a guy by the name of Irvin Kirk, uh, who was an elder in West Virginia. Um, he, um, for a long time, was a preacher in West Virginia. He wasn't one of my elders. He was old enough at that point that his son was one of our elders. Uh, and he was actually, he had, um, from the military, he had the asbestos in his lungs. Uh, and he was so, and that's a, that's a slow, miserable fade. And I would go over to his house, and he would lay on the couch, and he would just talk to me. And our church in West Virginia was studying this. And I, I grew up in a book, chapter, verse. You know, what is, the, what is the book, chapter, verse for this? And so I was struggling through this issue, and I said, Brother Irvin, just tell me, what is the book, chapter, verse for this? What, if you think what a woman, what can a woman do in church, book, chapter, verse? And through almost not imperceptible breathing, I heard him say, pray and prophesy. Book, chapter, verse. Uh, and, I, and it's such an impact on me. Now, here, here's the fascinating thing. Irvin Kirk was a Church of Christ preacher. John Mark Hicks uh, is a professor at Lipscomb University, the same Lipscomb uh, that said some of those quotes uh, that we read earlier. Also, Lipscomb has a female president uh, right now. Try to wrap your noggin around that one. Um, uh, Richard Oster is a professor of theology at Harding School of Theology in Memphis, Tennessee. He's been teaching this stuff about Corinthians for 25 years. Um, and Rubel Shelley is a Church of Christ minister. He now works at a church in Nashville uh, where Jason Pagel is the preaching minister. He grew up in this church. Uh, Rubel Shelley is at that church right now as one of their interim ministers. And the, the point is this. These guys aren't denominational guys. Uh, they aren't overly influenced by culture. They, 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 they are, matter of fact, a lot of them are college professors. They don't even pay attention to culture. Um, they, are, they are biblical scholars and theologians and preachers. Uh, when it comes to women's role in the restoration movement, there's always been three views. Uh, and they're the views that I put up earlier. And today, even now, you still, some of these three views still remain. Uh, that women can't do anything, that women are limited in their participation and what they can do, uh, or that women can do anything that men can do. And you can find churches of Christ in this country who follow all three of these things. Now, I want to say a couple things about this. Number one, they each depend on different passages as their primary view of this. Uh, the women who don't, um, who think women are totally limited, uh, rely on 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2. Um, the people who believe that women have a limited role rely more on 1 Corinthians 11, where it discusses women praying and prophesying, and the women. Um, you know, and the ones who believe that women can do anything that man can do rely on Galatians 3.28, which is the, there's no other Greek, Jew, slave, nor Scythian, male, nor female, but all are in Christ. Uh, we've studied all of those passages over the past five weeks, but it's fascinating that when you hold on to a theology, you go to the verse that seems to kind of agree with you, and that's the primary view of this. Now, I want to make some thoughts about this. I believe that the second position probably handles the passages from the other two extremes better than either one of the extremes handles 1 Corinthians 11. Um, 
in, let me put that a different way. It's, it's easier to understand in a church where women can pray and prophesy, why you would have to tell some women to be silent if they're being disruptive, than it is to understand in a church where you're telling all women to be silent, how women could be, then be praying and prophesying. And so, but also, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 has conversations about headship and how to do it respectfully and how to do it in a way that honors God and, and doesn't usurp authority. And so it gives, a, it gives instructions of how to do that well and take in both of the other verses into uh, effect. And so I, I think the second position handles scripture the best. The second thing is there's this perception that uh, position one is the way it's always done, um, always been done in the Church of Christ. And I will say that it has been the dominant one. It's the one that I grew up with, but it's not always been the way the Church of Christ and the Stone Campbell movement has viewed the scripture on this. That there's been a lot more diversity than what I thought at one time or what I was taught. And the third thing is position one depends on this idea of private prophecy. Like women can prophesy, but they got to do it in private. They can't do it in public. The problem with that is, scripturally speaking, I don't think there's any such thing as private prophecy. I mean, Every time that Paul mentions prophecy in the New Testament, he's talking about the assembly. Uh, and, and so, and I, and I really think that if, if it weren't for being in an assembly with mixed gender, there's no reason to cover the head. There's no reason to be respectful in that moment. So it seems like when he's talking about the assemblies, he's talking about women doing things in, in mixed gendered assemblies. And there's this other thing of, we, we have this view somehow of um, it, it's just about what we do in this room. Like, it's okay in our small groups and our, it's okay in our classes as long as it's not okay in the worship. Again, that doesn't seem to be an option that is scripturally available to us. Because the Bible only mentions in the New Testament a couple kinds of assemblies. One is what I would call even um, evangelistic assemblies where you had large crowds and, and Paul was out speaking and saying, hey, you're following the wrong gods here and trying to get people to come to the church. And then the other kind of assembly is the meeting in the homes of uh, what evolved into what we do in this room. They were meeting in the homes. They were having communion together. Uh, they were reading Paul's letters. Uh, they were having conversations about church. And that's kind of what uh, our church worship service evolved from. Now, here's the thing. There's not one set of rules that apply to some of those assemblies that wouldn't apply to all of them. And so, if you can read Scripture in class, you can read Scripture in here. If you can speak up in life group, if a woman can speak up in life group, then she can speak up in church. If a woman can pray over a meal in a home in mixed company in front of her husband, then she can pray over the communion service in our church. If, she can, if a woman can talk to our families about telling good stories on Saturday afternoon. She can talk to our church about telling good stories on Sunday. There doesn't seem to be one set of rules that applies to one of these assemblies that doesn't apply to all of them. And so it, in, the last thing is this. The men that shape our theology on this would already think that this church fits into category three. Because we have women reading scripture in some of our classes. We've had women praying in some of our life groups. We've had women speaking on videos in our assembly in this room. And more than that, we have women who are working outside the home in these spaces where they are considered equals. And because of that, these men would look at us and think we already fit into that second category. So this is not about culture and it's not about anything other than following scripture more closely and becoming more authentically who we already are. I have a Bible that was printed in 1800. Uh, that's one year after George Washington died and one year before Cain Ridge. Uh, it's that I can trace it through the names. It's been in my family since the Andrew Jackson Memorial. Uh, I would have loved to brought it this morning. It's packed up with my other precious books and I'm also very afraid that it'll fall apart when I touch it. So I, I keep it in a, a, a safe place. But that Bible's been in my family and this has always been for me personally about 
following the scripture, following that Bible, and I have a long family legacy of that in church and my physical family as well. If we are limiting the roles of women more than God meant for us to, then we're adding to scripture. We're enforcing our traditions over scripture, and we're quenching the fire of the Holy Spirit within our women. So I really believe it could not be more important that we get this right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the women and men in this room. Uh, thank you for the people who've been very patient with us as we've gone through this study. Uh, Father, no matter where we do and where we go, may this be a church that always elevates your word over our own feelings. And may we always follow your spirit and your holy word around. Uh, may I pray for our elders. I pray for the conversations that are going to happen about this in the, in the coming weeks. And I pray, Father, that you will give everyone a spirit of kindness and a spirit of family as we have these discussions. I ask all these things uh, because I believe in you so much. I believe that you are the uh, giver of all good things, the author and perfecter of our faith, the beginning and the end. And it's in your son's name I pray. All right, so uh, if any of you, when George was talking about the study the last five weeks, were thinking it seems a lot like a lot longer than that, you're right. It was actually seven weeks. <laughs> it was the last seven-week study. We, uh, we really wanted to have a, um, as in-depth a study on this topic as we could without dragging it out forever. And so uh, the last seven weeks, thank you for hanging in there with us and for listening and for participating and for asking questions. So I think... Uh, in conclusion, there's a couple of things we can all agree on. One is that we all want to do what God wants us to do. We want to do what's biblically correct, uh, not having any uh, influence from outside, uh, outside of the Bible and what God wants. Secondly, it's not an easy topic, right? It's not an easy topic. It's it's not something that is so clear that it's indisputable. It's something that that people can have uh, different opinions on and different ideas, and so. Uh, with that in mind, the question comes up, what happens next? Where do we go from here? And so we're, we're neither going to shut the, the book on this forever and say, okay, the study's done, we're done, nor are we going to start making a bunch of uh, uh, changes or doing things that we think uh, need to be done. What we're going to do is just, like I said last week, there's three things we'd like to do over the summer, and that's to study, study the Bible, study some of the references, the books that we've talked about. There's a list of those on the app, and we can get that list if you need that to you. Um, we're going to pray about it, uh, each individually and as a group, and we're going to uh, let the Holy Spirit work in us to show us the truth that we, we feel the scriptures uh, say we should, we should see in these passages. And thirdly, we're going to ask questions. We'd love for you to ask questions. The elders, on behalf of our elders, love to talk with you no matter what question you have on this topic, whether it, as was, was, was referenced this morning, nothing's too small. Uh, for us to talk to you about. If there's anything at all you'd like to speak to us about, please let us know. We would welcome and, and relish the opportunity to do that. Uh, so, so let us know that. So let's study, pray, let the Holy Spirit work, and let's talk to talk with each other. Now, beyond that, we've got a lot of stuff that we can be doing this summer together that are really important things. I mean, it's so important, and there's so, so many opportunities for us, and I'd really like to focus us on that if I could. Um, there's opportunities to serve. Uh, we're going to be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this community. We're going to be able to reach out, serve people, to, to spread his word, to let people know what God offers to them in terms of love, forgiveness, redemption, all of this. And, and it's such an exciting time for us to be able to do this together. We're going to grow closer together as a congregation. We're going to meet new people. We're going to bring people closer to God. And we're going to have this summer to do this together. And I just can't wait for these um, coming weeks, months, to see what God, how he works with us at, in this church at Northwest. Melissa and I have been blessed to be members here since 1982. And uh, I've said before, I can't even imagine what our lives would be like without being part of this church. And I'd love to see the time when, when, when our seats are filled up again. Not because of numbers. It's not, a, it's not about numbers, but it's about about changing people's lives. And so that's a responsibility we all have. It's not something that Joel and George and Casey 
and our you know other our staff. It's not up to them. It's not up to us. It's up to each one of us to do our part. Let's invite our friends, our neighbors, to be part of what we have here. Let's reach out. If there's former members that you um, haven't seen in a while, reach out to them. We've been doing that. Uh, the eldership has, but it's up for all of us to do that. And I, and I think the opportunity is just tremendous. So as we enter this summer, uh, let's think about just, just what the way God has blessed us and, and how we can share this with other others. Um, couldn't be more happy and excited about it, more blessed to be part of this congregation. So I don't know if I missed anything, um, guys, that needs to be said. I think we covered it all. So with that, uh, everybody have a wonderful day, and God bless. Thank you.